Well, uh, normally, uh, to begin, uh, before we do, uh, dive into the message, we, we have uh, someone uh, to read Scripture, uh, our passage for the day. Uh, this morning, my wife, uh, Danera, was the one reading the Scripture, but she, uh, she got a phone call. Uh, her dad's been in the hospital, and so uh, she needed to go and, and check on him. And uh, so she's with him. So she, she did the first service this morning, but uh, needed to, to take off. So, uh, so I'm going to read it for us together this morning. So here's, here's how this works, though. I'm going to read Mark chapter 1, verses 35 through 45. Uh, you can follow along uh, with me uh, in your Bible if you like. But uh, when we get to the end, this is, this is what we do. We need to practice this because some of us aren't used to this. We read the final uh, line of Scripture and we say, this is the word of the Lord. That's, that's what I say. And then you respond together in unison. As soon as I finish that, you say, praise be to God. Okay. That's, that's how we do this, all right? So I'll say, this is the word of the Lord, and then you will respond with praise be to God, all right? So just in case you need to know, that's, that's kind of how we do this. So Mark chapter 1, starting in verse 35, says this. It says, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he got up, went out, and made his way to a deserted place, and there he was praying. Simon and his, uh, and his uh, companions searched for him, and when they found him, they said, everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, let's go on to the neighboring villages so that I may preach there too. This is why I've come. He went into all of Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Then a man with leprosy came to him on his knees, begged him, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Moved with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched him. I am willing, he told him, be made clean. Immediately, the leprosy left him, and he was made clean. Then he sternly warned him and sent him away at once, telling telling him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go and show yourself to the priest, and offer what Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Yet he went out and began to proclaim it widely to spread the news, with the result that Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but he was out in the deserted places, and they came to him from everywhere. This is the word of the Lord. There you go. You got it. Good. Let's pray. Father, speak to us as we open the word together, God. Put your word deep down into our hearts. Let it bring forth fruit. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, uh, we are here in Mark chapter 1, but uh, if... Well, actually, let me let me do this. Let me show. I've got a picture here for you. Let me show you this. So uh, this is my family, right? So this is uh, that's not Pastor Bobby. That's Coach Bobby. Um, we just finished coaching a basketball game there. But that's my son Isaiah, my daughter Emerson, my wife Denera. Uh, after a basketball game earlier this year, this son Isaiah is uh, he's a freshman this year uh, in high school. My daughter is in seventh grade. And uh, my wife is a, an amazing counselor at a local high school and, and does an amazing job. But, uh, but that's my family. And every opportunity that I get to talk about my family, I'll take that opportunity to talk about my family because I, I love my family. And, and that's, that's kind of the deal, right? It's like when you love something, you find every opportunity 
to talk about that something, right? And so if it's your family, if it's a hobby, if it's your job, if it's, you know, your team, you know, whatever it is, like you get an opportunity to talk about something that you love, you take that opportunity and you do it. And you do it with enthusiasm, you do it with joy, and you probably even do it ad nauseum, right? Like it's just one of those things where it's like, can you please, is there anything else that you can talk about besides that, right? Please talk about something else because I've heard this a million times, but that's really the, the simple principle is that when you love something, you talk about it, right? You just, you just do. You talk about it. In the passage that we just read here in Mark chapter 1, Jesus has this encounter with a man who has leprosy. Jesus heals the man, and then Jesus tells him something kind of odd, something strange we'll look at in just a moment. But Jesus tells him, he's like, hey, do me a favor, don't tell anybody. Like, don't go and tell everybody what just happened here. In fact, the only person that you need to go tell is the priest so that he can deem you as clean, and, and then we can talk about that. But as of now, like, don't tell anybody else. And then the, the guy actually disobeys Jesus. That's another thing that we'll talk about. But disobeys Jesus, and he goes and he does what? He tells everybody. Right, he tells everybody. Which, on one hand... It's kind of a good thing, right? Like, but on the other hand, again, he, he disobeyed what Jesus asked him to do. But that's what happens. It's like when you love something, when you experience something that impacts and changes your life, what do you do? You tell people. You talk about it. You share it, right? And that's exactly what's happened with this man who has been healed. His life has been radically changed. And he had to tell everybody. He had to tell everybody. And so as we look at this passage of Scripture here this morning together, I want to show you three simple things that, that we learn from this passage and, and how we really just apply these things to our own lives. And so these three things, honestly, are really, really simple. As, as I'm going to walk through each one of them, they're really simple. But a lot of times, some of the simplest things are not the easiest things, right? Simple can sometimes be difficult to actually do. So it's simple to state, but it's not always the easiest thing to do. And so we'll look at those here in just a moment. But just to kind of give you a little context as to what is happening and, and how we've ended up at this point, Jesus, um, Jesus has at this point, his ministry is really just began, right? And so Jesus at the age of around 30 years old is beginning his earthly ministry. Uh, John the Baptist, we talked about him last week. John the Baptist sees Jesus, baptizes Jesus, tells everybody, he's like, hey, I've been baptizing and, and proclaiming the kingdom of God and telling everyone to repent, but now what I'm telling you to do is that's the guy. Like, I'm here to clear the way so that you will follow him because that is the Messiah. That is the guy pointing his way to Jesus. And then Jesus sort of just kind of gets started, right? He's, he's out and about and he's proclaiming the kingdom of God and he's preaching and teaching repent and believe that's what he says here in chapter 1 verse 15 and he's also healing people right casting out demons healing people that come to him so much so that word is getting out in the area and Jesus basically has rock star status at this point right like everywhere he goes like he can't, he just can't get into any place because everybody's like here comes Jesus and so crowds and huge Crowds of people would gather and come to Jesus, and they were all coming to Jesus really because they weren't really trying to figure out whether or not he, most of them, whether he was the Messiah or not. They were coming to Jesus because they had heard what Jesus could do. He could heal. And so if you were sick, if you were paralyzed, if you had a disease, if uh, you needed healing, you were coming 
to Jesus. In fact, there's one instance here in chapter 1, we won't look at it today, but there's this one, and you might be familiar with that, but there's a, a, a group of friends, and they've got a paralyzed friend, right? And they, uh, the crowd is so big, Jesus is inside of a house teaching, and the crowd is so big that they can't get their friend to Jesus, so what do they do? They take off the roof, they, they bring their boy up to the roof, put a hole in the roof, drop their boy down, like hopefully easily, right? But they drop him down to Jesus, and they were like, hey, the crowd was so big, we couldn't get to you, and so like we did whatever we had to do to get to you, to get our buddy to you, because he needs healing, right? And Jesus does, he, he heals him, he heals the man, and it's, and it's an amazing thing. But part of what's happening is every time, like all of these things that are happening, all these healings that Jesus is doing, every time this happen, happens, there are these Pharisees and religious leaders and, and you know, they're watching closely because they're like, what, this, this guy is, the only, the only way that this could be true is if there's something more to this guy, like, like he's claiming to be God. And there's got to be something with these healings. There's got to be something going on here, but we can't let this happen, right? And so they're, they're watching very closely at Jesus doing these things. And so, so much so, so when you get to, as you walk your way through chapter 1, Jesus enters in verse 21, really through uh, up to 35 where we were just at, Jesus has like this really long, long day, exhausting day of ministry where he is healing, casting out uh, demons. He, he even heals uh, Peter, uh, Simon Peter's mother-in-law, right? Like, like all of this. And, and so he, he goes through this really just long day, exhausting day of ministry. And when we pick it up in verse 35, it's basically the very next day. It says, very early in the morning, he gets up. And he goes out to a place that says a deserted place. So basically, he's just gotten out by himself, gotten alone, gotten away from all the crowds, gotten away from his disciples. And that's the other thing that he's done in this time, too, is he's started to call some, some people to, to follow him, right? You've got Peter, you've got Andrew, you've got uh, James, you've got John, uh, these disciples that are beginning to follow Jesus. And he gets out by himself to pray very early in the morning. Like the very next day, after this really long, exhausting day of ministry, it says that he gets up early, gets out by himself, goes out to pray. But then it says Simon, Peter, comes to him, and he says to him, he says, Hey, what are you doing out here? Like all the people are over there, and what does it say? It says, Everyone is looking for you. Right? And for Jesus, that just had to be, like, I don't know if you were, like, extrovert, introvert, you know what I'm talking about? Like, you don't mind being around big groups of crowds of people. That kind of energizes you for a moment, right? And then when you're done, you're done, you know? That's, that's me. That's what happens when I go home on Sundays, right? It's like, it's like hey, I love this, love being with y'all, but now I'm out of here, okay? So, like, I'm going to go home and nap for, like, eight hours. But that's, like, extrovert, introvert, right? I don't know that Jesus is necessarily like that, but he's like, I'm out here, I'm out here praying because I have a mission that God has sent me on, and I got to pray to be ready for that, to be powered up for that, to step into that. And here comes Peter, he's like, I don't know why you're out here, like, why are you out here? The people are over there, you're, you need to get back to the people. And so what does Jesus do? I love what Jesus' response is. Jesus is like, he says, now nah, we're going to get up on out of here. Um, verse 38, he says, let's go on to the neighboring villages so that I may preach there too. This is why I have come. That statement right there for Peter would have been like, huh? Wait, what? You preach? No, 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 no. Like all these people are here because they want you to heal them. Like they, they, they need you to like heal their diseases and cast out the demons and, and do all of those things. I mean, that's, that's why they're here. And Jesus is like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to do some of that, but that's not why I came. I didn't come to just physically heal. I'll, I'll do some of that, but that's not the point. And so what is the point? Well, Jesus tells us actually in chapter 1, verse 15, he says this. He says... The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. 
repent and believe the good news. That is the message of Jesus. That's when it says that he was going out to preach. Essentially, if you wanted to summarize what it is that Jesus is preaching and teaching, it's that. The kingdom of God has come. We just sang about that, by the way. The kingdom of God has come in the form of Jesus. The kingdom of God has come, and so repent, change direction, turn from your sin, turn to Jesus, and believe. That's the message. And that, and Jesus says, hey, that's why I'm here. That is the mission. That is the mission that I am on. Now, here's, here's the thing. Here's the interesting thing about this. We see this mission in action in the very next part of the passage of Scripture when Jesus heals the man, right? And when he heals the man with leprosy. And all throughout the rest of, not just the, the gospel of Mark, but all throughout the rest of the Scriptures, we see that message, repent and believe. This is the, mes- the, this is the, the mission of Jesus. And Peter and the boys, right, Peter and the disciples, they're totally missing this. Right? So most of the crowds are missing this. They're only coming to Jesus to get what Jesus can give to them. They don't want just Jesus. They want all the things that Jesus can give them. And Jesus is like, no, 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 no. Y'all are missing that. Like, that's good. That's, that's great. But there's something better. I actually want to give you something eternal not something in the moment, right? So there are three things, I think, that, that we learn ourselves from this passage of Scripture that uh, I want to show to you here really quickly. First one is this, is you and I, so as Christ followers, you and I, we first must embrace the mission and the commission of Jesus. And so what is that? Well, we just talked about what the mission is. As Jesus said, here, here's why I have come. He says, that's what he says here in verse 38. He says, I have come to preach this message, repent and believe. And so Jesus, Jesus is focused on the mission at hand. Even though Peter, I think, Peter doesn't get it at this moment. He's, he's, so when he comes to Jesus, it's like, hey, everybody, everybody's looking for you. I don't know why you're out here. Like, you need to be with all the people. Like, the crowd's over there. You're over here by yourself. I don't know why you're at, Like, we, we need you back over here. Like, that's the crowd. In Peter's mind, like, as these crowds are forming, part of Peter is like, here it is. The Messiah has come. The Savior has come. We're going to finally get out underneath Roman rule. Because he is going to lead the way. He's going to lead us out of Roman oppression. And Jesus is like, yeah, that's going to happen, just not the way that you think it's going to happen. I'm going to lead you out of oppression, but it's going to be spiritual oppression. And, and Peter doesn't quite get that just yet. He will at some later, much, much later. But Jesus is focused on the mission, and the mission is to proclaim the good news of the gospel. And so for you and I, as Christ followers, like Jesus' mission has to be our mission. We have to embrace the mission of Jesus ourselves because we are called to it. In fact, it's not just the mission, but it's also the commission. In fact, I, I love that word, right? Commission or commission, right? What, the word or the letters C-O, what, is, what does that mean? In addition to or with, right? It means with. And so when we read or see the Great Commission in the Scriptures in Matthew chapter 28, what is the, what is the Great Commission? Commission, with mission, like on mission with is what that means. The Great Commission is when Jesus states to his followers, to his disciples, he tells them just before, this has been after he has been crucified, he is resurrected, he's about to ascend to heaven, and he says this, he says, hey, I've got some instructions for you. As I leave, I want to give you your marching orders, your commission, right? I'm commissioning you to this. Go, he says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded to you. 
And remember, I'm with you always to the very end. That is what we call the Great Commission. Or I, I just like to say it, the Great Co-Mission. Because we are on mission with Jesus. And that is the mission, right? He, we have to embrace the mission and the commission of Jesus as his followers, right? And so Jesus' desire he, it was, was not to just heal physically. Most importantly, it was to bring spiritual healing through the repentance of sin. And the miracles that Jesus was performing, the, the healings and the casting out of the demons, they, these just validated Jesus' message, right? And so this great commission, if you will, there are, there, are, there are two greats in the Bible, right? There's the great commission and the great what? Anybody? Commandment, right. Yeah, which is that, the love, right? The, the great commandment, right? And so the great commandment is uh, Jesus quoting Deuteronomy, where Jesus says this. He says, uh, somebody asked him, he said, hey, Jesus, there's all these laws and commands and everything like that. Like, which one's the greatest? You've got to pick one. Which one is it? And Jesus is like, well, it's actually pretty simple. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, right? Love God, right? And then he adds a little to it. Not, it's like 1A and 1B. He was like, and because of that, love your neighbor as yourself. Love God, love people, right? Simply stated, right? So you have the, the great commandment. The great commission is the demonstration of the great commandment. If you love God, you will do as God has commanded. What did Jesus say? Go and make disciples, teaching them to obey all the things that I have, what? Commanded you, right? And so the great Commission is the demonstration of the great commandment. And if you love your neighbor as yourself, if you are a Christ follower, what has God given to you? He has given to you salvation. Salvation from sin. He has given you eternal life. He has given you the gospel deep down into your soul. He has given that to you. If you love people, if you love your neighbor as you love yourself, should we not also give that to them? To share it with them? To show them? To, to be a demonstration of that to them? Absolutely we should. And so we, you and I, we, we have to embrace the mission and the commission of Jesus. Right? This same mission mandate is ours. And so we, we see that here at the, in the Gospel of Mark, but we see that here in the very beginning. Jesus is telling his disciples, he says, let's go on to the neighboring villages so that I may preach there too. This is why I have come. He's saying, come with me. Be on mission with me. Let's go together. So we see that. The second thing that we see as Jesus says in the very next uh, passage here, verse 39, it says, He went into all of Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. And then a man with leprosy comes to him on his knees, begged him. He says, If you are willing, you can make me clean. And then verse 41, it says, Moved with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched him and said, I am willing. I am willing. And so the second thing that we see here is that the gospel demands radical compassion. The gospel demands radical compassion. Now, it's an interesting thing that takes place here. This, this man wasn't questioning Jesus' ability to heal, right? I think too often we, we kind of miss that because he comes to him and he says, if you are willing, you can make me clean. He's not saying, hey, can you make me clean? This man understands that Jesus can heal. Remember, rock star status, right? Word has traveled. Word has gotten out. Jesus is doing some healing. He's doing some things. That's why this guy comes to Jesus. He's like, I have leprosy. And I need delivered. I need healed from that. 
And I know that he can. But what the guy is actually asking, he's not asking, do you have the ability to heal me, but will you heal me? Will you choose to heal me? That's the question that he's asking. And when you think about this guy, this guy, this guy's, I mean, he has leprosy. So one, one thing that, like, we don't quite understand this in our current culture. But for that culture, for a person to have leprosy was basically a death sentence in a lot of ways. Not just physically, but emotionally, relationally. Like, if you had leprosy, here, here was the deal. So you were not allowed inside of the city gates. Like, you weren't allowed to be around just hanging out with people and crowds and groups of people. Like, you had to be kept separate. In fact, they had uh, leper camps, basically, where if you had these uh, skin-type diseases and these other kinds of ailments and diseases, you had to be kept, at, you, you would have to stay outside of the city gates, outside of the main part of the city, and just be hanging out with all the other lepers, right? And any time that you came in contact with any other people, you had to, to announce the fact that you were unclean. And so the rule of the day was that as you uh, came around other groups of people, if you had leprosy, you had to proclaim loudly, unclean, unclean, unclean. Like, could you imagine, right? You got a cold. Let's say you got a cold, right? And you're just walking around. You got to walk into the office and go, unclean, right here, unclean, right? And everybody's like, oh, step away from you. Get, get away. That's how it was, right? Here comes this man, and he's exclaiming, unclean, unclean. And the groups and the crowds of people just all went like this, right? I mean, you're just like, hey, I'm, I'm over here. I don't want to get anywhere near that. Plus, not only that, Jewish law said that you could never touch a person with leprosy. If you did, you were now considered to be unclean. And so you would have to go through the ritualistic cleansing, go to the priest and like do this whole bit. In fact, they were so uh, stern about this that they believed that if a a uh, person with leprosy stood under a tree, the shade of a tree, and you passed underneath the shade of the tree where a person with leprosy was at, and you passed through that shadow, because you passed through the shadow, you were now considered unclean. Like That's how extreme it was. And so this man with leprosy takes a risk in and of itself to come to Jesus and it says, Jesus, if you are willing, will you heal me? And I love what Jesus, I love what it's, first of all, I love what it says, because it says this. It says, moved with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and he touched him. Now that, the fact that Jesus touched him, that, that's, that's one thing, right? Think about this. This is God, right? God in the flesh. As we read through the Scripture, we see this happen. Jesus did not need to touch him to heal him, did he? We know there's a story where a man comes to Jesus and tells Jesus about someone who needs to be healed, and Jesus doesn't even go to them. like He just speaks, and they're healed, right? He doesn't even touch them. Jesus didn't need to touch the man with leprosy. But he does. Well, why does he do that? He knows that like everybody's watching, all these religious leaders, like they've been on his back already, and they're watching Jesus, and they're just trying to catch him, right? And Jesus reaches out his hand, and he touches him. He touches the man. I think Jesus was touching him out of love, right? His, his body needed the healing, but his soul needed the healing power of the love of Christ. And I, and I love the example that Jesus models for us, that he was moved with compassion to help someone in need. And so for Jesus to reach out his hand and touch them, I mean, that was, 
I mean, there was risk involved with that, right? Ridicule and danger and, I mean, you know, the Pharisees, I mean, they, they were the original cancel culture, right? I mean, they just, they were just waiting and trying to cancel Jesus. And they saw that and they were like, Psh, canceled. But Jesus, Jesus saw this man in need and said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to reach that need. And if you love someone, you meet all the needs you see because you are moved by compassion no matter what it takes. And so Jesus is he's going across the countryside to the out-of-the-way places and he's healing and he's touching and he's casting out demons, but most importantly, he is preaching the message. Repent and believe. Repent and believe. And yet, here we are. We ha- sometimes we have just a hard time going across the street or across the office or whatever, right? Or Jesus, is, Jesus is going to all the hard places, doing all the hard things. And He's laying this model out for us. The model of Jesus' compassion all throughout the Scripture calls us to a life of radical compassion for others as His followers. And so to be radically compassionate, we need to be aware of those that need healing, or or rather those who are spiritually lost without Christ as Savior. Like, we're not going around and casting out demons and, you know, healing people of... Uh, who are paralyzed and and, and those kinds of things. But what we are doing, what the mission that we are charged with is to still help bring about spiritual healing that only Jesus can bring. And so our job is to embrace the mission of Jesus and to be on mission with Jesus to bring that message of repent and believe the gospel, the good news of who Jesus is, what Jesus has done, what he can bring spiritually to people. Like Our job is to go to to the spiritually dark places. To those who, who need to hear about Christ as Savior. And so if we are radically compassionate toward the spiritually lost, then we have no choice but to be radically committed to the mission and the co-mission of Jesus because the gospel demands it on our lives. And so what what does that look like exactly? Let me show you really quickly. Matthew chapter 10. Jesus Jesus is about to send out the uh the 12 the 12 disciples and by sending them out he's he's sending them out on mission so that they they too can uh do the things that jesus has been teaching them and showing them themselves and so jesus gives them uh some instructions and he says as you go this is the way that i want you to go this is what i want you to do uh as you go and he tells them this he says in chapter 9 uh, he tells them, he says, hey, I want you to, I want you to look and to see that the, the harvest is plentiful. He's, he's telling them, he's like, hey, this is a, like an agricultural example of this. He's like, but you'll get this, you'll understand this. It's like the harvest is plentiful. Like the people are ready for this message. They need to hear this message. The harvest is plentiful, plentiful he says, but the workers are few. He says, so pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out the workers, is what he tells them, right? Which is... Our prayer as well, you know, that, that we, we see, we look, we see that the, the harvest is ready, that there are people everywhere, and we don't have to look very hard to find them, right? Like some of us are in this room together. Some of us are, are we're out of these doors as well. We don't have to look very hard to find people who are spiritually needy in spiritual dark places needing Jesus, they're the people you work with, they're the people you go to school with, they're the people that live right next door to you. Like they're, they're around us, right? We don't have to look very hard for that. But Jesus tells them, he says, so as I send you out, this is what I want you, this is, these are the people that I want you to go to, and this is what I want you to do. And so look at uh, chapter 10, verse 5, he says this, he says, Jesus, it says, Jesus sent out the twelve after giving them instructions. He says, don't take the road that leads to the Gentiles and don't enter any Samaritan town. 
Instead, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim. Again, here's this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Verse 8, he says, Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those with leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you received. What did he say next? Freely give. It's like, hey, you, you, you got this. Like, th- you received this. And it was given to you freely. And so give it back as you go. All right? And so in these verses, we see several principles, I think, to, to help us know how and where to be radically compassionate. Right? Where to go and, and what to do. And so the first thing that we see is, is where do we go? Well, here's one thing to understand about this. As you read this, you're like, so I'm supposed to go to, not go to the Gentiles or the road that leads to the Gentiles and no Samaritan towns, but to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's where I'm supposed to go. <laughs> That's more prescriptive for these disciples, right? There's, there's prescriptive text and there's descriptive text, meaning that there are some things that are prescriptive, meaning that they, they're just, they're prescribed to a certain group of people. Sometimes that is to us. Sometimes it is to who we are actually reading about. And then there's descriptive, meaning that there is, there's something that is being described to us, just so that we can see it and understand it, right? This text is it's prescriptive to his disciples in that moment, but it's descriptive to us in that it shows us some important principles. And so the, the important principles are, are simply this. Where do we go? Jesus says first, go to the greatest need. Go, go to the greatest need. Go to the sick. Go to the dying. Go to the despised. Go to the spiritually dark places. Right? And so to the sick and the disease. Who, who is that? Like for us now in our time, who is that? That is the, that is the people that need Jesus most, the, the spiritually lost, right? The sick and the diseased. Scripture oftentimes describes sin that way, as a disease, sick, right? We even use that, terms, uh, that term sometimes, we'll say, you know, they're sick with sin, right? I don't even know what that means, but that, I mean, that's, we'll, we'll, you've heard that before, right? And so to the sick and the diseased, Remember what Jesus says. Jesus said this. He said, I did not come. It's not that I've come to go to those that are healthy, but those who need a doctor to the sick. Now I'm paraphrasing the words of Jesus. And so we first go to the sick, the diseased. Secondly, to the to the dying. Right? To the to the dying. And I think, like in this, I, I, I would just simply say this. I, I, I think that radical compassion, like we need radical compassion to go to those who are not just sick physically, but closer to death because of their physical sickness. Like radical compassion to, to those who are in hospice care. Radical compassion to those who, who are in the hospital. Radical compassion to those who who are dealing with diseases and sickness that is undoubtedly leading quicker and quicker to death. Radical compassion to those. But then there's to the despised, right? For most people in this current or in that culture, if you had leprosy, you would be considered the despised. Nobody wanted to be around you. Right? Nobody wanted to be near the lepers. And so the lepers of our day are the ones that no one wants to be around. Those that have, those that have messed up. Right? Those, that, those that have caused others pain or have made mistakes. And Jesus says, go to the ones that no one wants to go to. In fact, we see that in Jesus' ministry, right? We often see where it says the, the religious leaders, the, the church people were like always upset because they were like, look at this man. Here he comes, eating and drinking and hanging out with sinners, tax collectors, and prostitutes, right? The people that no one wanted to hang out with. 
Because like those are the people that have messed up. Those are the people that have made mistakes. Those are the people that, that nobody should hang around with. You hang out with them, they're unclean, you're going to be unclean. And Jesus is like, but I like those people. Jesus liked the people that no one else liked. And you know what was always beautiful is that they liked him too. That's why they hung out with him. And then I think, lastly, to the, to the spiritually dark places. Jesus, Jesus cast out the demons. We see Jesus casting out unclean spirits, casting out demons. And so for you and I to go to the spiritually dark places, again, we, we don't have to go far. We, we live not only in a spiritually dark culture, but we, we live in a spiritually oppressed city. We do. We spend any time here in this town. It, like it, it's a great place, but pull back a couple of layers, and it's pretty dark too. And there are places like that all over the place. I'm not saying that this is the only one. There are places like that all over the place. But we just can't be, just can't be blind to it, right? And so if you are, uh, maybe you moved here from out west or from up north, and you've come down here and you look around and you're like, golly, I mean, there's a church on every corner out here, right? And you ain't wrong. I mean, it's true, right? I mean, literally, there's one right there, right? I mean, we're, we're two churches on this street, and this street ain't very, uh, it's not very long. And so you're not wrong about that. And so sometimes we think, well, I mean, how spiritually dark can it be? There's a church on every corner. There's churches everywhere around here, which means there should be church people all over the place. That might be part of the problem, but that might be, that might be part of the problem. However, don't let that fool you into thinking that just because there is a church on every corner, I assure you that there is not a full ch church on every corner. Just because there's a church there doesn't mean it's full. And it definitely doesn't mean that it's full of people who go, I want to embrace the mission and the commission of Jesus to do whatever it takes to preach the message of Jesus to spiritually dark places. And so we're, you and I, like, like we're missing it if we're only spending time with the healthy, the well-to-do, the, the growing believer, the, the accepted. Like, we, we like those people. I like those people. You like those people. And that, that's good. We, we should. But we also got to look at the model of Jesus. Who did Jesus spend his time with? Where did Jesus tell us to go? Who to, to be around and who to share the message with? And so, the last thing that we see here, and we see this with this man, Jesus heals the man, and he tells him, he says, don't, don't go tell anybody, only go tell the priest, so that he can deem you as clean, but don't tell anybody else. And what did the guy do? He went and he told everybody, right? And so, the last thing is this, is that changed people tell people. Changed people tell people. Now, why did, why did Jesus tell him not to tell anyone? Well, I think on one hand, I think Jesus knew that he would, right? I mean, he's God. He knew that he would. But he wanted to avoid being known only as a miracle worker. And so he didn't want people only coming to him for what he could give them and do for them. Because miracle working was secondary to his main mission, which was to announce the kingdom. Repent and believe. And so, again, by that, are, are, is, is that saying that we should not ask Jesus to heal us? Absolutely not. No. Again, prescriptive for that particular guy, right? Prescriptive for him. We know... Like, even in reading the, the Great Commission, what, is Jesus, what does Jesus tell us to do? Tell everybody, right? Like, tell everybody. Share that message. Go and make disciples. And so should we, so Jesus isn't saying, no, 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 no. I'm not saying 
don't come to me and ask for healing. Don't come to me and, and, and uh, ask for, to be made well and, and to be healed. That's not what he's saying. But I do think that this principle is true. Is that we should first want Him. To be satisfied in Christ, first and foremost. And listen, if that's all we get, if all we get is Him, that we should still be satisfied. Even if we need healing, even if we need to be made well, and Jesus says, not for you, that we would still go, man, God is still good, and I still love Him, whether He heals me or not. And listen, that's tough. I ain't, I'm not going to stand up here and say, man, you, you, like that's easy. That's not easy. I've seen a lot of people struggle with that, and I get it. I get it. That's, I mean, that's a message in and of itself. But we should first be satisfied in Him. But I'll, don't, don't miss this really quickly. Don't miss this. Jesus, Jesus told him to not tell anybody but the priest, and he disobeyed Jesus, right? He, he disobeyed Jesus, and he was like, now I'm going to go tell everybody. I know what you told me to do. Now, we don't know that he went to the priest. It doesn't say that he went to the priest. Like, we don't know that necessarily. All we see in the text is that he just went and he told everybody, and that's, like, that's probably another message for another time, but... The man no doubt thought that he was doing a good thing, but it describes as like, hey, part, the problem with this is, is that I'm not going to be able to go to like these other towns and places because the crowds are just going to be way too big and I'm not going to be able to get in there because they'll prevent me from, from getting in there. But it's interesting to me, uh, J. Vernon McGee said this once uh, of this particular passage. He said, Jesus told him to tell nobody and he told everybody. Jesus tells us to tell everybody, and we rarely tell anybody. Ouch, right? And so the principle, the principle is simple. Change people, tell people. Change people, tell people. And so if you've ever had something that has impacted your life greatly and deeply, just like we talked about in the very beginning, when I talked about my family, like when you talk about things that you love, you talk about things that have impacted you and have changed you. And listen, if you have been changed by Jesus, we should talk about it. We should talk about it to anybody and everybody. I... Um, I've made this very open and clear. When the restaurant Dos Bros opened up here in Oak Ridge, I tell everybody. <laughs> you know why? Because I love it. It's amazing. It's like Chipotle, but better, right? Way better. So I'll tell everybody. In fact, if you ever go to lunch with me, where are we going? We're going to Dos Bros, right? We're going to Dos Bros. I love Dos Bros, and I tell everybody about it, and I take everybody there, every opportunity that I get because I love it. And I think they, they're great. Like, they're local people, and they are great community partners here in the city uh, with us. They've uh, partnered with us on several things, but they, they're just great. And so I, I tell everybody about it. But that's the thing. It's like when something impacts you, when, some, when you get, like, Something happens and you're like, oh, that is amazing. Like, you just tell everybody about it because you love it. And here's why you do it, though. Do you know why you do it? Because you want them to experience what you've experienced. You want others to have what you have. And so we, like, it is, it is, we feel like it is our absolute privilege, opportunity, and duty to help you do just that every, every way that we possibly can. And so we, uh, we actually, we just did this. And so if you got the email this past week uh, that we sent out every week, you may have saw this. But we went and we said, hey, how can we help people tell people about Jesus? Like, how can we remove some of those barriers 
that make it difficult to do that. And so as a church, we said, here's, here's what we're going to do uh, because this is easy. We went out and we purchased this 20-foot inflatable movie screen and a projector and a sound system that's huge and loud and blaring and we packaged it all together and we said, we want to let you use it. Like, this is for you. It's not for us as a church necessarily, but it's for the community. And so local schools can use it. Organizations can use it. But most importantly, we want you to use it. And here's how we want you to use it. We want you to take that thing, blow it up in your backyard or your cul-de-sac in your neighborhood, and invite all the neighbors over. Have some food. Put a movie on. Watch a game together as long as it's a UT game. Watch a game together and enjoy that and have people over together for the reason for two reasons one to give you an opportunity to just meet your neighbors like i can't tell you how many people i talk to all the time and when we start start talking about neighbors like how many people we just don't know our neighbors we don't even know their names You're like yeah i mean the guy lives right next door like he's lived there forever i don't even know who he is like this is an opportunity for you to get to know your neighbors but not just get to know them but to establish some relationship with them so that at some point, it might not be at the movie, but it might be at some point later on. You've met them, now you know your, their name, they know you, your name, their kids have come over and watched the movie on this big, huge, inflatable movie screen. It was awesome, it's great. You're taking your trash down at the end of the street. He's taking his trash down at the end of the street. You're like, hey, how's it going? He's like, it's not going very well. Like, my wife just was diagnosed with cancer. Oh, and instead of doing the thing that we do so much and go, mm, man, that sucks, and walk away, we can go, can I, pray for, can I pray for her? Because now it's not, it shouldn't be awkward now. All in hopes that at some point, maybe it's not in that moment, but at some point that you're able to go, can I tell you about something that's absolutely just changed my life? And maybe you get an opportunity to tell them about Jesus. Maybe you get an opportunity to invite them here. Like, that's irrelevant, honestly. I'd rather you just tell them about Jesus. But that's the point. And so, here's the deal. You want to use that, we have it for you. We, we've made it available for you. Uh, if you want to go ahead and, and get it reserved, we have a form that you can fill out. But you can take that Connect card, the, your little QR code there on the back of your seat, on your Connect card, say, hey, I'm interested in grabbing that movie screen at some point. Uh, let us know, okay? We'll get you that information. And it's available. It's ready. It's ready to be used. All right, so let me say this. Last thing is Charles Spurgeon once said this. He said, I will not believe that you have tasted of the honey of the gospel if you can eat it all yourself. True grace puts an end to all spiritual monopoly. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word this morning. God, we pray that uh, your word just moves us to action. God, to, to not just hear it, but do it. Because that's what your word calls us to. And so, Father, help us. Like you, Father, let us, let us embrace the mission to tell others to about you, to repent and believe the good news of the gospel. God, to, to be bold and to reach out with radical compassion to, to meet the needs of others so that maybe we have just a, an opportunity to share with them how you have impacted and changed our lives and have touched and healed us spiritually. And maybe in some cases even physically. And so, Father, help us. Because changed people tell people. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Hey, will you stand and sing? We're going to take a moment to, to just respond to the word by singing and praying and, and maybe even just asking the Lord to, to help us and show us what our next step is. But as we do so, communion is available. The body of Christ, the blood of Christ given to us and for us. And as Jesus said, he said, every time you do this, I want you to, 
to remember me, to think of me, to be reminded. You want to talk about radical compassion? There it is. There it is. That a man would lay down his life in order that we could have life. And so when you're ready, it's available here, also in the back there. And so you come.